So I've been a nurse RN and nurse practitioner for a couple of years now. Um, I actually have a bachelor's degree, which I got many more years ago. Um, I have a, a bachelor of arts degree in Spanish and international business. So completely unrelated to science, nursing, um, when I kind of, you know, went into the, you know, career field and working and I ended up in a pediatric office where, um, I really learned the ins and the outs of, you know, I started at the front, you know, I learned the administrative part and then I was kind of went to the back half. I did, I was working as a medical assistant in pediatrics and then, you know, nursing was really where I wanted to go. So, um, that being said, I had a Bachelor of Arts degree and I had zero science. So I, like John mentioned, I had to go to um, a local community college, college so I could get those prerequisites to even be able to apply for nursing school. Um, so I was working full time. I was going to school full time in the evenings and I did, you know, psychology, chemistry, a and um, you know, nursing school prerequisites, you name it. I did it at that time. Um, you know, so, someone had a question about, um, kind of that first semester of nursing school and what was the most surprising thing about that first semester, whether it was like the amount of work or just <clears throat> getting used to everything. Um, well, the program that I did was a, an accelerated BSN nursing program. So it was really heavy duty, fast paced, 16 months of school. Um, I didn't get the summer off. It was just semester, 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 graduated in 16 months. So I think the first, you know, the most surprising thing was, well, as I was anticipating it as well, is that I wasn't able to work really. Um, so I had to go in full time. I was doing classes. Um, it was a hybrid program too. So some of the classes were online. We had labs that were in person and then we have clinicals all kind of initially right from the start. Um, I would say one of the most surprising things was that, you know, in the first semester of nursing school, they had us do, um, labor and delivery clinical round before, you know, even in a med surge or anything like that. So they really just threw you in there um, and just, you know, they gave you a heavy course load. Um, I almost felt like they were trying to, you know, see if we can make it, see if we could hack it with uh, the heavy course load and the intense clinical setting. But, um, you know, you just got to... You got to make it your main priority. It's only temporary and um, you'll get through it. And someone was asking about nursing scholarships uh, for people that are going to start nursing school. Did you have any nursing scholarships or do you know people that did or anything around that? Um, I didn't have any nursing scholarships, um, but I do recommend that whichever school you go to or you want to go to, you know, whether you're doing final financial aid or paying in a pocket, you know, reach out to the school's, um, you know, finance, you know, finance department and financial aid department and, you know, see what they have available. Um, they may have specific scholarships um, for their own nursing students. Um, so just, you know, do a Google search, you know, research scholarship for nursing students and, um, you know, utilize the resources that you have available at your school because um, they will be the most helpful. And the people in the offices there are really, they're there to help you. They're there for a reason. So don't be afraid to um, utilize them. Okay, cool. That's definitely helpful. Um, uh, so good question. Jennifer Nader is asking if it's doable with a newborn, the accelerated program. And if you guys didn't know, Melissa's my wife. And that's a little bit of her background. She's a nursing, um, a, a pediatric nurse practitioner now. And my background is actually test prep. So my family owned a test prep company and I worked there for, you know, the company's been around for about 25 years. And I worked there for 20 of those 25 years. And once I saw Melissa's going through the nursing school, 
um, it was always something that I wanted to do to start my own um, test prep company. So she really influenced kind of what we decided to go after. And I mentioned that because we have we have kids. We have two kids now. And Melissa is actually eight months pregnant and she is due October 22nd. And I can't remember if Summer, our first daughter, was around when you were in nursing school. Um. She wasn't. Okay. Uh, well, she was around for the the nurse practitioner part. I uh, I think my the first round when I did the accelerated BSN, um, I did not have any children, um, but that doesn't mean it's impossible. Um, you just you you'll get your schedule. It'll be a semester long, um, and you know it might change semester by semester. And then you just kind of you figure out your child care, care situation. You're not going to be, as a student, you're not going to be doing overnights. You won't be, you know, in clinical settings, you're not going to be doing the 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. shift. You're going to be the, you know, maybe a 7 a.m. to a 3 p.m. shift. You're, you're there with your, your classmates, usually with like a group of five. So it's, you're not there for 12 plus hours. And then the rest is schoolwork and whether or not it's online, um, taking virtual classes or in person, there's not a ton of classes. A lot of it's going to be, you know, the clinicals, you're going to be doing work at home. Um, there's not a ton of papers. Um, my school specifically like to throw in a few research courses, which, you know, would be like one per semester. So it's not super overwhelming. You just got to stay on top of it. And, you know, if you have a newborn which I think sometimes are easier than, you know, the toddlers, um, you, you should be able to get through it. Um, just, you know, make sure you're planning um, your days and, you know, you're sticking on top of that schedule. And I actually did graduate school um, my last year, my fall and summer, or fall and spring. Um, I had my second baby in October. So I kind of, you know, with a newborn, I finished my last semester of um, my master's nursing program. So it's not impossible. You can do it. Cool. Awesome. The next question is, which route is best if you want to work in a clinic, an LPN or an RN? Um, I guess it, it, it depends. I think if you have an idea of maybe a clinic that you want to work in, um, I find that more more clinics, maybe um, primary care, might um, hire the LPN versus the RN, where I think you see a lot of RNs in the hospital settings, but that's not always true because I, I worked as an RN in a pediatric primary care office. So it's where we didn't have any LPN. So I think you would have to do some, you know, local research of, um, you know, clinics in your area that you think that you're going to be residing in and be working in and just kind of, you know, even call around and see what, you know, or go to their website, see who's on staff, how many LPNs do they have on staff? Do they have any LPNs? Do they have any RNs? How many RNs do they have? And then, you know, before you really make the big jump, Kind of see what that job market looks like in your area and then kind of make the decision from there. Okay, cool. So this one's from Ivy Rosales and she is going in depth here. Uh, she wants to know in what ways has nursing school challenged you? Part one. Uh, and how has it made you a better nurse? Oh, good question. Um, I think challenged me, um, first of all, because I was, I was not coming from a medical background at all. Um, and, you know, I think nursing school is great because you, you do a variety of clinicals. You do the labor and delivery. You do med surge. You do a psych. Um, I was able to go to the OR. I saw a knee replacement, a hip replacement. Uh, I've seen a baby born. You know, you, you do pediatrics. You do a wide variety of um, clinicals. And I really think that's the best part about nursing school is because you, that's where you learn. It's when you're doing the job, um, even though you're a student and you are working alongside another nurse. Um, 
And I think that, you know, what made me a better nurse is that I was able to experience all those different um, aspects of nursing. And I was able to, you know, say, hey, I don't really like med serves, but, you know, I really like labor and delivery. And, you know, that that helped me, um, you know, when I was studying for my NCLEX. And then when I was looking for my first job, I it helped me focus more on what I really wanted and I knew what would have made me happier in the long run. Okay, cool. That is a good answer. Um, Mm -hmm. And then Emmy's asking, how did you study or learn the information after not having a science background? Well, um, at the community college that I went to um, school, you know, the classes are anatomy and physiology. You have, there's two parts to it, um, AMP1, AMP2. You have, like, a basic chemistry. And, you know, they're, they're intro classes. So I think um, even not having that AMP background or science background, you know, taking those in- intro courses to really get your foot foot in the door was was great. And, you know, it was really interesting and being, you know, at the time I was an adult learner. I wasn't 18 fresh out of high school or, you know, it just doesn't matter how old you are, but being an adult, you're not in high school. You're, you're, you know, ready to learn. You know, this is what you're going for. This is going to be your career and you're excited to learn all that new stuff. And, you know, especially in anatomy and physiology, all that stuff is, it's pretty cool. Um, So, you know, just having the drive to do it, um, it's going to make you more motivated to get it done and learn the information well, because that's what you need to know. Yeah, and I remember you having to go through a lot of those prereqs at community college. Um, even though she had a bachelor's degree, like she said, in science or, or in Spanish, uh, but she didn't have all that science coursework. So you had to go to Bunker Hill Community College in Boston and do all those. So that was sort of your primer to all the science and kind of doing it all over again. So even though she didn't have the background, she did have to go and do all that coursework again yeah. before she got into nursing school. And you just want to keep in mind that when you are, so you say so you're kind of in the same same boat where you're doing those prerequisites, you're taking the A&P, just keep in mind that once you get into nursing school, they're not there. I mean, they're teaching you the basics of being a nurse, but they're not there to teach you what, how the heart works. Like that's why you do the anatomy, physiology and, and all those other courses and chemistry, you know, there's more, <laughs> more to uh, the prereqs than A and P, but you know, you really want to, you know, focus on your studies and, you know, take it seriously because once you get into nursing school, they expect you to already know that stuff. Cool. So you don't want to be lagging behind learning the basics when you, you need to, you know, keep up with everyone. Hey, everybody. Um, so I'll answer. Uh, Deline Francois uh, asked, she's studying for two weeks for the TIS. Is that a good thing to only study for two weeks? The test is September 28th. Um, the applications open up next month, so she wants to have that done quickly. Generally, we would say two weeks is not really enough. It really depends on everybody. Everybody's a little bit different, though. If you've taken AMP 1 and 2, you're going to be in a much better spot for the science section of the test. If uh, English is not your first language, you might need more time to study, um, you know, the reading and the English section. So it really depends on folks and how familiar they are with these subjects already. Generally, two weeks is not enough. This is a lot of material to know, and generally, like six to eight weeks is a better time frame. Um, so, you know, see how well you can do in two weeks. It's not impossible. You can definitely do well. It all just kind of depends on. How comfortable you are with that information already. Um, let's see. Do you recommend an associate's program or a bachelor's from Alejandra Pina? Um, I would say bachelor's only because there are, um, if you're going to be an RN, I definitely go for the bachelor's because many states, if not already, are mandating that RNs have a bachelor's degree and those who don't have it will probably eventually have to go back to school and get it. So if you were like, Hey, I just, I don't want to do all the courses right now, but I, you know, I will go back and do it. Um, that's fine. But just, you know, take a look at, you know, your state's law because it's, it's all based by state. So, um, 
so wherever you are, see what they, what they require. They may already require it. So, um, you know, you don't want to go through the associates program and find out that you have to get the bachelor's within two years. You might as well just get it done now. Um, okay. That makes sense. Um, someone else says they're looking to an ABSN program. Um, was it difficult forming study groups in your ABSN? Did you do study groups? This is all pre COVID of course, you know, so yeah. it was a thing back then, maybe less now that people are getting together on campus in person, but. So the ABSN, if anyone's not uh, familiar is, you know, an accelerated bachelor of science in nursing program, which is what I did. It was 16 months. Um, and you know, the, the, how my school was doing it is what they had a fall start, they had a spring start and they had a summer start. So, you know, each, each start they considered a cohort and, you know, within your cohort, there were so many students. I think we may have had like 30. So, you know, if you really take the time to get to know the people in your cohort, you know, you're going to be spending a lot of time with people in your clinicals and, um, you know, those are going to be the, the best people to kind of meet with because, you know, they have a similar schedule to you. So be like, hey, do you want to study together? Do you want to compare notes? And, you know, you know, it's it, if you if you make the effort, you know, it won't be as difficult and they'll be they'll want the help, too. So, OK, so there's a there's a few folks who are asking questions, TIS related and sort of more on what's the best way to break down all the subjects, the study. Um, how long do you think you think that TIS test should be studied for? So a few of those questions coming around the same topic. So I can kind of jump in on those. Um, you know, one of the best ways to study for the TIS is to really understand what your strengths and weaknesses are. Um, just to get an idea, you should be able to say math, science, reading, English, one of them I, I feel pretty good about, one or more of them I don't feel good about, but it's not even enough to know that I'm, I'm not good at science. It's specifically within science, what, what are you having trouble with? Is it A and P? Is it chemistry? Is it biology, life sciences? And then go a step further within A and P. Are there specific systems that you're having trouble with or biology, things like that? And one of the best ways to start is with a practice test. So if you have the Smart Edition Academy online course or the study guidebook, you have access to practice tests. There's a lot of free practice tests online as well. We have a great free practice test you guys can take. I'll put that in the comments. Uh, but what that practice test does is gives you a scored report that breaks down every question by the individual topic. So if you took the science practice test, it'll tell you there were four questions on the cardio system, four questions on the muscular system, and so on. And you can see which ones you didn't really answer well. Um, or you might be taking the math uh, timed practice test and you see that word problems are totally tripping you up and you're taking way too much time on word problems. Um, that's kind of something you need to focus on. So the idea is to understand what your weak areas are, where you need improvement and then have a good study resource that you can go and dive into and really um, work on those weak areas as much as you can. And then there's a lot around creating a good study schedule. And you know, one thing that you guys wanna do is make sure that you're getting repetition in on those weak areas. So if, again, if word problems is the issue, don't just study it for one day, study it on Monday, go back to it on Wednesday, go back to it the following Monday, and again, the following Wednesday, and get that repetition in. And that's how you really kind of drill it in um, for retention to learn those things. So a lot of people just skip around a lot and don't focus uh, on their weak areas and they don't continually kind of work on those weak areas. So that's a little bit of advice. And then other than that, you know, uh, good study resources is a good option. There's lots of free stuff on YouTube, stuff like that. But you know, one of the advantages to an online course like Smart Edition is everything's organized for the exact topics that are on the test. So you don't have to spend all your time trying to figure out what's on the test. You don't have to do that. You just can just study. Um, and so, you know, those are a couple of things that, that might help you guys. Um, so someone, got, uh, Lorindra had a comment that I just want to read off, um, sort of a question, but she says, um, I'm an LPN at, at her clinic. Not much difference between me and the RN in terms of the work that she's doing. Uh, is the pay worth the extra work? Um, and she says that's up to up to, for debate, but the tuition reimbursement is nice. So at least that's that's her take on it. Um, in terms of the expectations of the LPN, she's kind of doing similar work to the RN. Do you think it's harder to find a job as a new grad? Um. 
new grads, I think regardless of the, the, the career are always have their challenges. Um, if you are looking to go the hospital route, um, a lot of hospitals offer um, RN new grad programs, and it's basically they give you however long, sometimes it's 12 months, six months, um, like a, a time frame where you are, you're working as a nurse, but it's more of like a, I wouldn't say like an intern program, but it, it's a program to help the new grads trans, you know, come out of school and get them acquainted with, um, you know, being a new nurse. And a lot of people who are nurses are nurses for 20, 30 years. So I, you know, I would just, um, uh, look at your options, look at where you live, look at, you know, the hospitals, um, and just, you know, put yourself out there. And like I said before, you're going to figure out what you like, what you don't like. And, um, you know, say you like pediatrics, you know, look at all the pediatric practices, primary care, look at the pediatric hospitals, look at the pediatric floors in a regular hospital and, you know, see what they have to offer and, you know, don't give up. And, and let me ask you, Melissa, because you were a pediatric nurse practitioner and this may be different for LPNs and RNs in terms of like how easy is it to get a job right out of school. I know if we're being honest, you had a really hard time getting a nurse practitioner a job. And one of the issues was every, you know, many job postings said they wanted two to three years experience. Mm -hmm. All of them said that. So how do you get two or three years experience uh, as a new grad NP? So she ran into that a lot and people just wanted um, nurse, the NP to have experience with nursing. So, I mean, I know the answer, but did you really find like nurse practitioners to be uh, different in finding a job? And and I know from what I've read, it's much more difficult to becoming much more saturated. And like, it seems like everybody these days just wants to also be a nurse practitioner. But um, in many cases, there aren't enough jobs for the amount of nurse practitioners they're cranking out of schools right now. Um, so something definitely to think about. But Melissa can talk about that a little so bit. Yeah, I think it's definitely the market is the job market's a little bit different for the RNs um, compared to the NPs. And especially right now, um, I think, you know, I think there's a nursing shortage. Um, so I would, you know, like I said before, look at all the options in your area. Um, look at, you know, the locations you think you'd want to work and apply, apply, apply. Sometimes you're just applying online and you think that you're sending your resume and all your information into a dark hole, um, don't be afraid to call the, you know, HR office and say, hey, I, uh, I sent in my application two weeks ago. I was just wondering what the status of that is. Um, and, you know, there's many different positions, especially in a hospital. There's, there's tons, tons of positions. And right now, I think you may not have a hard time finding a job. So Yeah, and Lorenzo... Uh... Ramdas says network, network, network. And I can say from more of a business side, I, I have more like I went to business school, I got my master's in business and networking is absolutely huge for getting jobs. And I can say most employers would rather hire someone that's been referred to them. Mm -hmm. My friend is looking for a job. My cousin is looking for a job. She's great. I recommend her. Um, I'm a business owner. I own Smart Edition. And if we are looking for, to, say, to hire another marketing person, I would any day of the week take someone I know's recommendation over a resume just, you know, submitted blankly to our info at smarteditionmedia.com. Doesn't go as far. So um, networking can be huge. And you just have to think about it, like reach out to everybody you know. Everybody knows somebody. Um, and if there's events and things like that, definitely try and do that stuff. That's my advice. Definitely networking. That's Lorenzo's advice as well. So I just wanted to uh, put that out there as well. Um, yeah. And just put yourself out there and, you know, you know, you might not know anyone who works in a hospital, but, you know, if you're in a nursing program, you're going to have a group of other people who are just about to be nurses. And, you know, maybe someone gets a job before you and, you know, maybe they can be like, oh, hey, we're still hiring on our floor. And, you know, they can reach out to their su nursing supervisor and they reach out to you and, they yeah. could recommend you and, you know, just there's all so many different ways to network. Right. And Lorenzo also says keep an eye out for nursing fellowship programs as well. Yeah. So that's yeah. similar to like the, the RN 
they call it like an RN residency program, um, yeah. which, you know, after like a med school, when you become a resident, you, you go through med school and then you're a resident, you learn how to be the doctor. So um, similar to nursing. But. So another question that's interesting, especially from Lisa, because she did have a, a bachelor's in Spanish is, can becoming bilingual help get you a higher salary, which is interesting. I'm not as, I'm, I'll let her answer that, but I don't think it's as much of a higher salary, but definitely, especially depending on your location, if you're in South Florida, like we are, or Texas or Arizona or California, places where there's large Spanish speaking populations, all things being equal, one person is bilingual, the other person is not exact same resumes. I think it helps, but Melissa. Yeah, can definitely. I don't, I don't know necessarily if that will affect the salary, but it will definitely affect um, your hiring status. And it's uh, definitely bonus points. I'm sure. From yeah, for sure. And you know, when you're looking at jobs in general, um, like we're in South Florida. So say you're looking down here, um, there's definitely job postings that say must speak Spanish because otherwise you're not going to be able to ask, ask someone if they have pain or, you're not going to be able to communicate with them when you're in the office with them. So. And it's probably going to depend on the setting as well, like hospitals, ER. It's definitely going to help um, a pediatric doctor's office. It may not be as necessary or as helpful, but um, that'll kind of depend on the setting. Um, okay, cool. Um, so what's some other kind of just general uh, stuff more around like the TEAS and the nursing school entrance exams, how to be a better test taker? Uh, is a question from Marwa. Uh, she's also asking, do a lot of people struggle with the TEAS? I failed it twice. I have text anxiety and ideas to help with that. I definitely have um, two ideas for it. I, I think those are kind of both the same question, how to be a better test taker and how to um, not have test anxiety. So do people struggle with the TEAS? Absolutely. Um, do people take it more than once? Uh, more people probably take it more than once than only take it once. So I've told this to other people, they're like, I feel terrible. I have to take it for a third time. You are not alone. It, you and everyone else has to take it a second time or a third time. And a lot of times people do well on the test and they get their required score, but they want to go that extra distance and be competitive for their program. So if their program requires a 65 and they got a 66, they want to take it again. They want to try and get that 72 or 75. And that depends on how competitive your program is. Places like California are very competitive. Um, you may want to take it again to get that better score and position yourself better. Um, so don't feel bad if you have to take it more than once. Um, and then for that test anxiety and how to be a better test taker, I actually just wrote a really long blog article and we'll be posting a video on YouTube about kind of timed practice tests and how they help you with test anxiety. So there's a bit of anxiety around there's so much material to know it's giving me anxiety. You know, that that's one type. And for that, you really just have to become more comfortable with the material. Um, but the other part really is when you go to sit down for that test day, whether you're at a testing location or taking it from home, that timer starts and you're like, Oh shit, what do I do? Like I have 28 minutes to answer these questions. Um, oh my God. And you kind of get flustered. And if you start falling behind, um, you know, I, I brought up word problems before. If you're if you're taking too long, uh, it might be reading section. You're taking too long on those passages. It's very easy to get flustered of like, uh, oh my god, the, the clock is ticking. So that can cause a lot of anxiety. And the best thing you can do is really take as many practice tests as you can, and, and make sure that they're timed practice tests and get comfortable with that timing. Uh, which is one thing just on each section, but then also it's almost a three and a half hour test. So that is like running a marathon for your brain. So you don't want to be going into test day the first time you're having to sit for a three and a half hour test. You want to have sat for a three and a half hour test like at least once, twice, three times, four times, you know, or more, depending on how much time you have to study. Um, I know in our online course, we have eight practice test, eight time to practice test that you can take as many times as you like. So just getting comfortable with that duration of your brain having to work, um, you won't cop out on the last section in the last 20 minutes where your brain's not even working anymore. It'll just help you feel more comfortable, less anxiety, and then just being com more comfortable with the timing of the test and answering the questions in the allotted amount of time is going to take away some of that anxiety. You know you've nailed it five different times on the practice test. You're not going to have that anxiety. 
Um, as far as the anxiety of all the other stuff of just like, what if I get in? What if I don't? What am I going to do with my life? That kind of stuff. You, you just want to practice as much material as you can and become comfortable with it. Take time, practice, test, and, and kind of do that. So that's kind of what you can do for that. Alan Hang is... Well, actually, before we get to Alan's questions, um, Amy, Con Amy Contreras, uh, is it common for people in nursing school to question if they are smart enough to be a nurse? Yeah, I would say anyone doing anything at times may question themselves. You know, even sometimes I question myself. I'm like, what am I doing? What have I got myself into? But, you know, if you, if you made it that far, you know, don't give up. And, you know, it's going to get tough. Um, you may cry, you may feel like giving up, but don't, you made it that far. You, you took the T's, you passed the T's, you applied to school, you paid the money, you know, if it's something you really enjoy, don't give up. Yeah. And, and really the reality, you know, like, like I said, I went to graduate school. It was not for nursing school. It, it was for business. But if you knew everything, the day you started your program, you wouldn't need to go to your program. We're there to learn. We're there because we don't know everything. So don't be a, uh, don't be thrown off if you don't know stuff or you don't think you're smart enough. Literally, everybody is there because they don't know this stuff and they're there to learn. Some subjects are going to be more challenging than others. You may have to get other resources um, at the school to help you out with stuff. You may have to spend more time than the next person, uh, but it's all kind of that grit and determination. If you got into the program, if you did well enough on the T's and got accepted, you are special. You are smart enough. You're there you're not there. You didn't get into the program because you weren't smart enough. And, you know, they chose you for a reason. They chose you for a reason. So it's just kind of a matter of like pushing through those really difficult um, subjects and things. And for me, I'm not good at math. And I had to take economic courses and they were really difficult. And math's not my thing, but I was able to get through and I was there to learn. So I didn't know everything when I went in. And, and keep in mind, when you're in nursing school, especially in an accelerated program, they are there to teach you how to be a nurse. They're teaching you the basics. You have labs, you have clinicals, you have coursework. You are, you know, and you are seeing so much and learning so much. You're not going to learn everything about being a nurse in the 16 months that you're in nursing school. You're going to learn a majority of the things that you are doing when you have a job. Um, for example, there were a, a couple times in my clinicals where they had me um, initiate uh, putting in a straight cath on a patient. You know, I tried three times. I could not get it. The nurse I was working with tried three times. She could not get it. She had to get another nurse to do it. Nobody's perfect. And, you know, someone who, um, you know, puts IVs in, you're going to learn things on the job and that you may not even have seen in nursing school. So don't get discouraged. Um, you, the things you need to know for your, your job, you'll learn it. And then Alan Hang asks, how many days did you have clinicals and lectures per week? Um, it, you know, it depends on your program. Um, I would say in my accelerated program, I, my my program was also hybrid, so I had some classes where I just logged on the computer. Um, some I could do on my own time. I could do them at 10 p.m. if I wanted to because they were just pre-recorded lectures. Um, so it really depends on the type of program you're doing. But to also, say you have two clinicals a semester, you're probably going to be there once a week at least. Um, so there's two days right there. So you have a day of lab, you know, it's going to be pretty hefty coursework. You're not going to have one day of school and then you have the rest of the week free. I would say count on three, four, if not five days a week. Um, and in, in my program, I had labs on Saturday mornings the first semester. So um, how, how much of your schedule did you get to like register for versus, you know, these are required. You have to take all five of these classes this semester versus like you have to take a total number of credits. Mm -hmm. You decide when you want to take them and how you want to take them. And if you want to load up your schedule and go crazy, you can do that. If you want yeah. to not do that, you know. So with the accelerated program, there's 
you know, you, you don't have a ton of time to take all these fun courses that you might be interested in that they don't really exist in that program. They usually have a, um, no, no film classes, no, 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 no PE class. No, no. Uh, no. Usually they'll no have art, no art class and you can yeah. usually go, you know, you go to Northeastern and look at the accelerated, um, nursing BSN program. They have listed out the, the program and the credits that you need to take and what you need to take semester one. So you can do part two, semester two, you know, they have a, like a, a plan for you. Like you need to take this before you could take this before you could take this. Um, so pretty much you're not really choosing. Yes, you do have to register for your classes, but it's pretty much already laid out for you. Um, so you don't have too much choice, but I think that makes it a little bit easier because everyone's on the same track. Okay. Um, Tanya's asking, is it good to have a small study group in nursing school? Yeah. I mean, there were times where I studied with one other person. There was the times I studied with three other people. Um, but I would say like, I like smaller better because you can meet up at someone's house. You can meet up at a coffee shop. Whereas if you had a group of 15 people that could get a little bit overwhelming, there's yeah. a lot of too, too many cooks in the kitchen sometimes. So, you know, whatever works for you. Some people yeah. don't work well in groups. Some people only work well in groups. So you got to see yeah. what works well for you. And there's definitely different types of learners as well. Some people are solo learners. They really like just kind of digging into it themselves. Other are more social learners and they do learn well with two or three other people mm -hmm. um, kind of bounce off each other. So um, I would say it definitely can't hurt if you do it and you find it doesn't work for you, then don't do it. Um, but otherwise, I think it definitely helps to have it's just good to have one or two or three other people who might know the answer to the question or like um, you're getting into med dosage and they're feeling really good about that and they can kind of help you actually get through it and you'll do that for the next person on the next subject. So definitely not a bad thing to do. Um, and um, going back to when he just said med dosage, we would have um, frequent um, tests, not even part of like a class, but part of our cohort um, math tests on um, med, med dosing and conversions and you know so you're going to want to know your basic conversions um, how to get you know pounds to kilograms how to get milligrams to mls you know you're going to want to know those basics and um, how to convert them so just be prepared that's the kind of math you're going to see uh, so diamond peels asking um I've taken the test twice already and still haven't received my desired score. And I've been losing a lot of confidence between exams. Um, any tips on this? Um, you know, I can kind of take this. We, we talked a little bit about this. I'm not sure if you were um, on the call, Diamond, kind of about just some general things about, you know, taking practice tests and getting more familiar with them, really trying to identify your strengths and weaknesses, um, knowing things like you know what is going to be on the test so if it's a science section you know anatomy and physiology is the majority of that section make sure you're studying that those are kind of the high value um, topics that you can be studying chemistry yes you'll get some questions but you shouldn't don't expect 75 percent of the test to be chemistry it will be a and p so focus on those areas um, and then in between or just about the confidence I, I think we've talked about that as well um, you know you have to keep going. That's it. I mean, we talked a bit about that, but I mean, keep your head up, keep going. You will do well. You are not the only person who has taken it twice and is going to take it a third time. Many, many people do that. I would encourage you to go into our Facebook study group and just post, ask the question, who here has taken the test two times or more? And you'll probably have 40 people jump on it and say, you are not alone. Um, you should not feel uh, discouraged and and I think that's where people lose a lot of confidence they think that they're the only ones that are having a trouble with the test you're not there's so many people um, that it takes a few times um, and Natasha's asking how uh, how long do you recommend studying before taking the T's again this really depends like if you've taken AMP one and two you don't need to study that as much if English is your not your first language you're gonna need to spend more time on reading in English Typically, to get through everything, given you don't have any external outlying factors like that, six to eight weeks should be enough. Some people go as much as 12 weeks, um, but I wouldn't go one or two weeks. That's cramming, and if you're not familiar with the material, it's not going to be enough time. So shoot for that, like, uh, anywhere between four, six, eight, 12 weeks, um, something like that. Um, 
And and remember, you know, when you do get into nursing school, when you graduate from your program, you will need to take the NCLEX. Um, you need to pass an NCLEX, which is the National Certifying Board exam, to become a registered nurse. Um, so the testing never ends. <laughs> uh, so someone's asking also, any study study tips for patho? Um, are you currently in a pathophysiology class? Is that, or? She said yes. Okay. You know, if you're in a class right now, you know, study the material. Um, you know, I'm trying to think back of patho. Um, a lot of cellular stuff, you know, just, you know, focus on what you're learning at that time. Cause once you're, when you're tested on it, it's going to be on that material, maybe a little bit more, but within the chapters you're studying, um, you know, if it's, you know, you're reading a textbook, of course you don't need to know word for word, but you know, know the terms, know the important terms and what things mean, um, how things work, um, you know, don't don't skip over something because you think, oh, that might not be on there. Brenda Lee is asking, you know, what's the best way to retain the anatomy and physiology information, specifically on the HESI, which is really the same for the TS and the Kaplan nursing exam. We know there's a lot on there. Um, we know that um, hormones are like definitely something, you know, that you'll need to know well. Um, but I don't know if Melissa has anything to kind of... Um... For the anatomy and physiology, you're gonna you you definitely want to know, you know, the anatomy of the body. You want to know, like think break break it down by by system. You know, you got the cardiovascular system. You want to know how it works. What what is the heart? What where are the atriums? Where are the ventricles? How do you what goes into the heart? What comes out of the heart? You want to you want to know that for most pretty much all the systems. Um, and get a, a you know a, a pretty good general idea of how everything works and how it all works together. Okay, it, it's a lot, so it's kind of a loaded question that's hard yeah. to answer. But you just got to study it and just do that repetition. Just make sure you're 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 going back to each system over and over and over again, and that kind of helps drill it in. Uh, if you guys want some good laughs, we just joined TikTok as well, and we're trying to come up with this. Uh, fun videos for you guys as we can. So those will be coming out a lot and um, that'll be a lot of fun for, I think, everybody. So check that out and then check out the uh, the website, the group, all that stuff. So you guys got it. Um, sounds like everybody has found this helpful. So I appreciate everybody's time. I appreciate you guys joining us. I know it can be late for the East Coast people, um, but that'll be it for tonight. So we'll look forward to seeing you guys all tomorrow. Have a good night, everyone, and uh, get your get your study caps on tomorrow for AMP. All right, everybody, have a good night. Good night.